Hi, I'm Gary, and this is episode 144 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at different ways to get a used EV on your drive. This season of the podcast is sponsored by Zap App, the free to download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Before we start, I'd like to correct an error from a previous episode. In number 142, the private jet episode, I said that it would be better to take the 36 flights that depart London for New York every day and put those passengers on a cruise ship instead. Listener Lewis Standing pointed out to me that the carbon footprint for cruise ships is actually higher per passenger kilometre than flying, which means that statement about sending them on a ship is nonsense. So just ignore me. Our main topic of discussion today is ways to get a used or pre-owned or pre-loved second-hand electric vehicle onto your driveway. I know that not everyone can afford a brand new EV. There are still people for whom anything more than a few thousand pounds is going to be difficult to justify from a cost point of view, regardless of the savings elsewhere. For many of us, the only way into this is through the second-hand market. So today we're going to be talking second-hand, pre-loved and pre-owned used EVs. I'd like to welcome back to the podcast Jonathan Porterfield, second-hand EV dealer extraordinaire and the man who is single-handedly responsible for pretty much the majority of the electric vehicles currently running around on Orkney. Welcome, Jonathan. Welcome, Gary. Thanks for having me back. (laughs) My pleasure. When I need to talk about second-hand, use EVs, you're the man, top of my list. So we last spoke about two years ago when you came on to talk about the same subject. And at the time, there were cars available, but they tended to be Leafs, Zoe's. Uh, The prices were still relatively high due to the newness of the whole second-hand EV market at that time. So do you want to start by giving us sort of a bit of an overall view of the whole market, new and used, and then sort of focus a little bit more on on where the second-hand market is at the moment. How long is your podcast? (laughs) (laughs) I can can edit out what we don't need. (laughs) So looking at new first, so at the moment I'm working with a great project here on Orkney called Reflex Orkney, which in a nutshell is uh, a subsidised lease to get more EVs on Orkney to help Mm. mitigate the fact we've got too much electricity on our grid. So this UKRI, Innovate UK backed government scheme was to encourage people to get into an EV to help take some of the pressure off our grid. So more EVs, suck more of the power off the grid, help decarbonise Orkney. And one of the key elements is transport. And if we're making too much electricity through renewables, then we're having to turn turbines off it naturally followed that let's get more EVs, let's get people into EVs, let's give them an incentive to make that switch and reduce the carbon. So that in a nutshell is what I've been working with, along with Drive Electric, who I've known for a long time, a a leasing broker. And I've been heading the leasing side. Now, the reason I'm talking about this when it comes to new EVs is that, as you, you and your listeners already know, there's been quite a... Uh, an issue with regard to supply of new EVs because of the lack of uh, semiconductors and silicon chips and the whole COVID and everything. So just sort of a little bit of insight behind the scenes of leasing. In the past, any funder by a a leasing broker will approach a manufacturer and say, we want to buy, uh, for instance, you know, 500 leaf. We want to put our name on 500 leaf. You know, what sort of discount are we going to get? And traditionally, every car manufacturer would give pretty hefty discounts to a big buyer, like a big funder. That, over the last two or three months, has totally disappeared because, as you can appreciate, Nissan, for instance, can't build the leaf fast enough. So why on earth should they discount their product if they can't make them and sit and, and, and hit demand? So the discounts, <clears throat> excuse me, for brand new cars for the fleet market has vastly been reduced by the manufacturers because of, again, if they, they can't make them fast enough. So that's had a knock-on effect where there isn't any bargains to be had. It's even to the funders, you know, they're saying, well, 
you know, the list price for a Nissan Leaf M connector is, I don't know, twenty six, twenty seven thousand pounds. That's what you're going to have to pay if you're buying fifty or you're buying five hundred. That is the price. So that has then meant that the price for leasing a new electric vehicle has also risen as well because the discounts aren't there that were there. Having said that, you and I chatted at Fully Charged and you gave, I think it was Fully Charged, where you brought down, did you bring down an E-Up at that point? Or did we talk about those specifically? Because I remember you giving me some yes. some quotes on the E-Up, which made my jaw drop. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about those? So we were doing E-Ups, a cracking little EV, quite underrated. But basically, we were offering them just to people who lived on Orkney with the subsidised Reflex project funding. It was £800 initial rental over uh, two or three years. But if it was over three years, it was £99 a month. As you can imagine, we've done, I think, around about 35 uh, Volkswagen E-Ups to people who live here on Orkney. So that was brilliant. But again, because of supply and demand, the government... uh, Plug-in car grant uh, was was axed by the government in March, I think, December and then March. So that disappeared. The discount from Volkswagen disappeared, basically meant towards the end of the project, they weren't £99 anymore. They were around about £190, £220, around about £200 a month. So that's, that's a combination of grants dropping and discount ending, but more importantly, the the discount from the manufacturer ending as well. And that was in the space of, well, in the space of six months that the whole new EV world was turned on its head because of those factors, supply, plug-in car grant being dropped, and the fact that manufacturers didn't want a discount because they couldn't get the parts to make the cars in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. I remember looking... Oh, 12 months ago, uh, again on, I think it was Drive Electric, and they had the E-Up at that time for mm. 150 a month, uh, which, again, at that time was absolutely fantastic. This this was for everywhere, not just for Orkney. I looked at it the other day, and it's up at 230 240 for exactly the same lease on that. So, yes, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Talk to me a little bit about how the market has changed as a result of and since lockdown. Uh, how's the market changed? It's made people that are still running those old-fashioned internal combustion engine smoke draggers. It's made them sort of look at their usage. And obviously, with the current economic crisis, everyone is looking at their costs. So it's made people consider an electric vehicle. It's, 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 it's focused their minds more sharply on EVs, particularly here on Orkney, but also with eco cars, which I still help to manage, the rest of the UK inquiries have been really strong over the over the lockdown COVID period as well. What's caused that? I think in part, leaving COVID aside, people realising that by 2030, no new internal combustion engine vehicles here in the UK will be sold brand new. The, um, so that has made people think, well, goodness me, this this fairly smart diesel or petrol car I've still got, I really perhaps need to get out of it now while it's still worth something and then, and make the switch now because we know it's coming. That has been one of the most commonly used statements that I've heard from people, be it leased or, or used new, uh, used purchase, is, is there no, the writing's on the wall for fossil fuel, basically. Well, I'm looking at the SMMT figures that have come out. We're recording this um, early in September. I'm not sure exactly when it's going to out. But uh, if I look year on year, battery electric vehicles up 48.8% to a 14% market share. Now, I mean, when we first chatted a couple of years ago, we were nowhere near those figures. So, you know, as you say, I think the upcoming 2030 ban has really focused people's minds, hasn't it? So, And, and I think, you know, just watching... You know, normal television here in the UK, I think every car advert I see is for an electric car. I can't remember the last time I saw an advert for a diesel or a pot or a petrol car on the telly. It's that everything is everything's electric, apart from the dreaded um, Toyota, of course, but we won't talk about that. Of, of course. So let, let's get specific. What are the popular second-hand electric vehicles? When we first chatted, um, because of the nature of the market, it was the Leafs and the Zoe's. 
maybe the IMEF and, and equivalents. Has this changed substantially or are those still the, the main ones? I think the LEAF is, is still the mainstay used for people because they recognise it, particularly the 2018 LEAF, because it looks so sort of, well, it looks more normal than the Mark 1 LEAF that was um, from Japan. So the LEAF is still really popular, again, because of price point. Price point for most people is, it limits their choice. So there's so many thousands of people with £10,000 to spend, but there's there's less people with 15 and even less with 20. And, and the higher it goes up, the less the market is for that particular price point. So the most popular is for people to uh, rustle together either through a bank loan or savings is £10,000. So again, as of September 2022, the biggest majority of available used EVs in that price bracket is the Nissan Leaf. Um, the Renault Zoe sort of fell out of favour a little bit with the whole battery lease on the earlier models, but that is being phased out slowly by Renault. But there's still a question mark over uh, older Zoe's and the battery lease, which tends to put people off, which is something I predicted years ago. Um, uh, and it's, it's still the leaf, to be honest, in that price point. Now, anything lower, sort of around five, four, five thousand pounds. Obviously, there's so many more people with that amount of money to spend, and that in the past, as of today, has been the Mitsubishi IMEF and the two clones, so the Citroen C Zero and Peugeot Ion, cracking little cars. I've sold tens, probably probably just over a hundred of them over the years. They're really great little EVs. I love them. But they've become even more rare. And before we came on tonight, I just checked to see what was available. And there is there is none available on all the main auction websites because it's not that they've been scrapped or they've disappeared off the planet. It's just that people don't sell them <laughs> because they're such great little EVs. So when they do appear on market, again, a 2012 example, two, three years ago, I would have bought that for around £3,000. If I saw a 2012 example now, it would be at least five. And that was that would be for me to buy it in the trade, even though it's still, you know, a 10-year-old EV. But it's finding them. But it's, yeah, there, there is no such thing at the moment as, as a cheap bargain electric vehicle because they're all commanding really strong prices. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about sort of finding these. One of the things that has changed... I would imagine dramatically since the last time we we spoke is that there are now a lot more used electric vehicles coming onto the market from leases. I mean, I've I've just given back my um, my three year Kia Soul. So, um, are you sourcing many cars from the end of lease market? Yes. So we sourced and, and cancelled leases as well. So we sourced an eighteen month uh, eighteen month old E Nero Four Plus for a really good. Uh, managing director friend of mine up here on Orkney um, and we sourced that and that was before fees that was just over £36,000 it was a say 18 month old car 6,000 miles in silver um, grade one condition had a tiny mark on a wing mirror that in effect after fees and transport was around £39,000 so that wasn't far off its actual screen Manufactured manufacturer's list price when it was new. Now, again, traditionally over the decades of new cars, you know, everyone would say, oh, as soon as you drive a brand new car out of the showroom, it devalues three or four thousand pounds the minute it turns a wheel off the pitch. And in the past, yeah, that was the case. It's not anymore. <laughs> um, I do hear people of uh, people pre ordering a, a new EV, like the MG4 that's about to come out. There's lots of my friends that I know that have pre ordered one because they 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 could be able to flip it. They'll be able to have it for a month. And then if there's if the order book is full within weeks, they'll be able to sell it at a slight profit because humans being humans, we don't like to wait for stuff. We want it instantly. Now you've been in the business for quite a few years. Have you ever been in a situation like that where the second-hand market is just as, I won't use the word buoyant, but the prices are up uh, around the same level as new. Um, have, you no, have you witnessed that 
before? No, I haven't. And it has to be said, it's not just EVs as well. It is actually you know, internal combustion engine vehicles. So the, the whole supply issue has, has affected all cars. So it is a crazy market everywhere. But uh, obviously, because I just concentrate on electric vehicles and nothing else, it's, that's all I tend to focus on. But other people in the trade have said the same about fossil fuel cars. Um, I'm going to come back to you know your prognostications for where the market's going to go in a little while. But let's um, let's just sort of have a, a, a few general questions about the vehicles themselves. If somebody comes to you and says, I want a new, I want a second-hand electric vehicle, what, what should they be looking at or what should they be looking for when they're uh, buying a second-hand vehicle, um, second-hand electric vehicle? What are the, the key things to look out for? So what to look for with second-hand cars it depends whether you're buying privately or or from a dealer. If it's from a dealer, obviously you're covered by the consumer uh, uh, consumer buy consumer act, so you've got no worries there. But the thing that people do worry about is battery degradation. So you can ask, as in the case of the Nissan Leaf, for um, a state of health of the battery through something simple called a Leaf Spy. Now I know a lot of other used EV dealers will actually give a, a printout or proof of the actual state of health of the battery. Then you look at other vehicles like the BMW i3. That's got such brilliant thermal management on the battery pack that they don't even register the temperature of the battery. And anecdotally, really old 150,000 mile plus i3s, when they have had the diagnostic plugged into them, have still been in the high 90 percentages with with battery state of health. So certain makes and models are better than others. Um, that's the one that everyone wants to check for. The other things are just the obvious checks, you know, is HPR clear? The old adage, if it's too good to be true, you know, it probably is. So, you know, if something's ridiculously cheap, it's, it's probably a scam. And there's lots of that happening on Facebook and eBay. And so you just got to be careful. Because in this day and age, no one is going to sell something thousands of pounds below what it's really worth just for the sake of being a wonderful human being. <laughs> we all want the best values. It doesn't happen. So if it's too cheap, there's a reason why it's too cheap. So just just buy beware uh, with regard to that. And that just, just finally, just certain makes and models. So I'm not a Nissan Leaf hater by any means. It's a great car, but the 30 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf you've got to be really careful. Some 30 kilowatt hour leaf have got great state of health at 50, 60,000 miles. The others, they can have serious degradation. Um, and that's just because Nissan packs so many modules into the 30 kilowatt that uh, it was quite easy for the, the stack of modules at the back, near the back seat, to overheat and then lose capacity so the 30 kilowatt leaf i'm always really really cautious about recommending the 24s are virtually bomb proof some degradation but it's more of a reliable bet than going for a 30 um the 30 is a bit like russian roulette to be honest you, you, some some will be brilliant and i'd say over 50 percent will have serious issues with the battery so that's my only word of advice with regard to the leaf and there's there's no real way of knowing that before buying, is there? There's not other than the, the um, capacity on the dashboard. When you start the old shape leaf up, you'll see the capacity bars, um, or again, pl uh, leaf spy to get the dealer to show you the state of health of the uh, of the battery. But just be aware, the thirty kilowatt can suffer from heavier degradation than the twenty fours. And now uh, the big sort of bugbear that we have on this podcast and we've talked about it before is the way main dealers are treating electric vehicles uh, they're very much more focused on internal combustion so are main dealers understanding the second hand market better now than they were it's getting better but there's still a huge amount of dealers that uh, i wouldn't say if Manufacturers are a little bit like drug addicts. They've got to wean themselves off petrol and diesel before 2030. But, you know, franchise dealers are going to have incentives from the from the manufacturer to shift so many Nishan Cash guys 
diesels um, or, or or whatever, there's going to be more incentives to shift that internal combustion energy stock than there is to try and promote EVs. So there is that incentive for the salesman to sort of say, well, you know, do you really want an EV? Because, you know, you've got to wait hours and hours for it to charge up and the infrastructure isn't brilliant and, you know, be much better off with this. We've got a cracking deal on this diesel this month. I hear a lot of that going on still, which is just economics, isn't it? It's just business. Yeah. But it, it, it annoys me <laughs> <laughs> greatly. Yes, join, join the club. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you can't blame them, but at the end of the day, they're not really doing anybody any favours and it's only going to come back and bite them in the arse, isn't it, really? It is because, I mean, yeah, it's not doing the customer any favours because that internal combustion engine car isn't going to retain a huge amount of value as we get nearer and nearer 2030. So, yeah. It's, um, but all the dealers are getting better. I still hear a lot of misinformation. I was I was at um, GridServe at Weatherby just last week on my way down to Leicester and Monero. And a lovely couple came up. And they were seriously fig- trying to work out how to charge their. What did they have? I think they had an i. And it wasn't an i pace. It was a BMW X4. It's one of the new BMWs. He had no idea on how to charge it. He says, Oh, only, I've only had it a couple of weeks. This is our first long drive. He had not a Scooby clue, honestly. It was woeful. Terrible. I thought, Goodness me, this chap must have spent 60 odd grand on this car. And he, yeah, lovely couple, really appreciative of the five minutes it took for me to explain charge rates, you know, which plug to use. Yeah. <laughs> you see, when, when you said an e-tron, I thought, oh, it's going to be someone where they've tried to plug the DC charger in, but I hadn't realised that there's a little flap at the bottom of the... The flap, so yeah. So they were... Uh, that they were char- oh, yeah. yeah. It's, it, and it's, yeah. again, when you tell this to people... It's like Christmas. Their eyes light up. Oh, I can use rapid charging, you know, and it's it's literally a 10-second thing for a dealer to to tell them, and it just seems to fall between the cracks, doesn't it? They open the flap and they go, oh, there's that shape pointing to the Type 2 connection. They go to the, you know, the rapid if it's one of the older ones with three-headed rapids, and they go, well, that one fits, plugging in the AC connector, and then they wonder why it's taking, you know, it's only pulling seven kilowatts, and it's like, there's no one told you about the flap underneath. No, what's that then? Now, generally, sort of looping back to something we talked about a few seconds ago, are batteries holding up for the much older cars? You've talked about the the Leaf and we talked about the the Zoe and the fact that they've got the battery lease. But, you know, one of the big pieces of fear, uncertainty and doubt is, oh, these batteries will last three years and then you're going to have to replace them. Now, you've been in the business long enough to know that that's not true. But generally, uh, what sort of, performance are you seeing from batteries in terms of high mileage vehicles that still have good state of health on the batteries? So it sort of falls into two camps. You've got the older EVs and also the, the newer EVs. So there's, uh, I've seen several reports of people with the new Kia E-Nero 64 kilowatt hour being used as taxis with over 100,000 miles you know, on it. You know, And I think the, the E-Nero has been out now for four years, three years. So that's a case in point. And they're still they're still showing, you know, 280 mile range, 300 mile range on a nice warm day. So no degradation yet reported on high mileage Kia E Nero. And the other end of the scale, um, I did a video oh, a couple of years ago now um, on my YouTube channel, quick plug for my YouTube channel, on a Mitsubishi Imiev that I bought, ridiculously cheap, with 70 odd thousand miles um, and I'd have some serious work done on that not for the battery so it was a 10 year old EV with a ten, probably an 11 year old battery when the battery was made uh, the biggest thing with the this little IMEF was the rot on the chassis it was seriously rotten underneath now the drivetrain and the motor were absolutely fine so I did it as a little project did a little video about it Spent the best part of two thousand pound getting it welded up and the bodywork sorted, but everything else was just absolutely fine. So the batteries, in the case of that car, would will outlast the bodywork, and that was from you know a twenty twelve, two thousand eleven actually Mitsubishi Imiev. So the the batteries are will outlast the vehicles. 
Do you see the market sort of softening at any time? Uh, you know, we've talked about having uh, used vehicles at up around the same price as, as new. That can't last forever. But what, what's your prognostication for this then? It's, it, I think it's really hard. I mean, this current economic crisis that's affecting everybody, you know, the cost of, <laughs> the cost of electricity, the cost of gas, the, the, the rising cost of living because of the gas line issue from uh, from Russia, etc. That is causing people to not buy luxury items. Everyone's watching the pennies. Now, whether that's going to transfer into there being less demand for used EVs at the auction site from the dealers, whether the dealers are going to go, do you know what? We haven't had anyone walk through the showroom in the last week. No way can we... Um, can you know buy some fresh stock if we haven't got footfall because people aren't buying anymore because they're worried about the cost of living whether that will happen i don't know um see the market for people that have retired and they've got some money and they want to splash out for want of a better word on an ev i think they'll still remain but as regards the man who's you know working 40 hours a week with a young family who wants to do his bit and wants to make the switch. Maybe he's going to think twice between getting an EV and sticking with the petrol diesel guzzler that he's got because he's unsure about where his job's going to be in, in six months' time. So it, it, it's just a whole cauldron of if, buts and maybes that I think makes the market so unpredictable as to where it's going to go. But at the minute, I've not, really seen any massive reductions in in used values is still really buoyant now what that could be like in i won't say six months what that'll be like in six weeks what that'll be like in six days <laughs> i've no idea it's that much of a fluid situation but i i think you'll agree with me we can't continue or it, it won't continue indefinitely with the situation where the used market the used market and the new market are almost parity yeah, I, it, it won't. No, it's 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 going to tip, and I think that price parity between EV, a new EV, and a new internal combustion engine vehicle is getting really close. I think just this week with MG announcing the pricing for the MG Four, whatever your views are on the Chinese market and the Chinese, the China government or whatever, you know, that's really good value, and I think that will continue to see that where. You get a well-spec Volkswagen diesel or petrol Golf. That's going to be so much more than that MG4 that's that's really well equipped and with a genuine 250 mile range. So I think that price parity on new is coming, and I think that will filter down okay. to to use. Yeah. 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 Uh, when we last spoke, uh, you said that something like 90% of all the electric vehicles on Orkney were purchased through you. Now, obviously, you've been working with reflex orkney in the meantime when we've talked about some of the incredible deals that they provide with help from the uh the government and the lease companies how many evs have you now sold on orkney i don't know personally it, it's we've leased just over 200 as part of the reflex project so by my reckoning there is now approaching 650 evs on orkney now it might not sound a lot but we've got 22,000 people that live on orkney 10,000 vehicles so we're at about six and a half percent which is pretty high compared to the rest of the uk and like any small community word of mouth is is, is really strong funny enough just today i was i did a compliance call for for drive electric for a customer for leasing a e-expert van because there's seriously a bakery here on all they're seriously looking at it because the lady who i spoke to her parents have just had an ev and they're ranting and raving about it. Think it's think it's the best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> no pun intended, but um, that's just island life. You know, people talk to each other. Well, is it, you've had that electric vehicle. Is it good? It's brilliant. It's fantastic. Oh, really? And then it it just snowballs. So that's been really great to see. From when I moved here in 2013, I think there were seven EVs on Orkney. I say we're now approaching 650. All not from me, but a vast majority is word of mouth and. You know, doing events, doing shows, doing science week, just getting people to have a go in an EV, slowly but surely changing their perception of, of how good they are. And through 
ecocars.net, do you still do the £350 offer for the uh, second-hand cars? Yes. So ecocars has been bought out by Reflex Orkney Limited. So I'm staying on as a consultant. So I've now got a team of four or five people that, that do this um, car buying service. And so the board of directors have just last week announced that there's going to be a change in the pricing structure. So the details will be on the eco-cars.net website. Basically, it's up to a certain amount. It could be £300 and it's going to be tiered. So if you're buying a, a £50,000 car, I think it's going to be £450 fee. But it's still really reasonable. Um, but yeah, so it, it's uh, still a, an auction trade buying service. Okay. I'll, I'll put all the links to your website and everything in the show notes for the uh, for the listeners. Uh, can we talk vans? What's your knowledge of the van market? Yeah, it's great to see that change. You know, in the past, it has just been the ENV 200 from Nissan and the Peugeot um, partner or the Citroën Berlingo uh, for years. They were the only commercial ones. But now we're seeing from the Stellantis group, so you've got the Vauxhall Vivaro, the Peugeot e-expert and the Citroen, uh, part, uh, Citroen Berlingo, all one of the same van. Um, so they're, they're coming on with bigger battery sizes, rapid charging, CCS rapid charging, which is great. Um, still got the larger van is still a bit of an issue. So Renault do that nice, big, high roof line Renault master van. But um, unless I'm mistaken, I believe that is still just Type 2 charging. Renault, I, I scratched my head with Renault at the best of times, but why they've not fitted CCS to the Renault Master, I have no idea. Can't be that expensive. But yeah. And then you've got the likes of Mercedes with their Vito Vanna, which again, the early ones were just Type 2. But... Uh, and Volkswagen, I think, with their the Volkswagen Crafter van was just Type 2. But all the newer ones have all got um, CCS DC Rapid on board. I think initially these manufacturers thought, well, these are just going to be for last mile deliveries, you know, just short little runs. So why fit CCS? But as you and your listeners know, no one in their right mind is going to consider any vehicle, any electric vehicle that can't have the ability to rapid charge, even if you're never going to do a long trip where you need to rapid charge just having it there is a comfort <laughs> to people so um yeah the, the the van market is 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 buoyant it still needs a few holes plugging <laughs> uh with regard to size thank you very much jonathan excellent discussion as always interesting to hear him confirm what we basically know about battery life in electric vehicles that they'll outlast the car rather than being replaced after three years, as some people in the media, no names Jeremy Clarkson, would have you believe. I also spoke with Brian Altstadt from FindMyElectric.com, who does a similar thing to Jonathan, but his company is based in the US. Obviously, their markets are a little different, so I asked him about how things are going over there. Do you want to start by giving me an overall view of the market for all electric vehicles in the US at the moment, not just the, the used market? Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. We've had tons and tons of EVs listed. We deal with customers every day who are looking to sell their EVs. We deal with, you know, a variety of EV dealers. So we kind of have a unique perspective on, um, we really have our finger on the pulse of both the new Tesla production, new EV production, and the used market and kind of how one informs the other. So to kind of circle back and answer your, your um, initial question, it's, it's uh, as some people say here, it's, it's tough out in the streets. You know, if you're looking to buy a used EV, um, you're going to be paying a premium that's primarily driven by the fact that production is so low and that's really struggling here in the U.S., you know, it's kind of just a basic supply and demand issue. But yeah, we've got, you know, very similar delays here in the U.S. Um, the SNX are out to 2023 or so. And that's been you know, prim the primary driving factor of, of EV, used EV prices. So, and that, that kind of just stems from the whole, you know, pandemic chip shortage and supply chain issues. And, um, you know, prices are high. But, uh, it trickles down to the used market. And a lot of used EVs are selling for 
if they're new to 2022, even 2021, in some cases, they're selling for over MSRP. The demand is just far outpaces supply. And it's variable a bit depending upon the manufacturer. Ford Lightning is kind of tough right now. It's hard to get one of those. The the most notorious example, I think, in, in the EV world is the Hummer, the hum, GMC Hummer EV, which was right around 100000 110000 for MSRP, and they're still selling for almost 200000 So if you were able to get your hands on one or two of those, you could expect a, a healthy profit there. Um, but, you know, on the other side, too, it's sort of, um, you know, has has an issue with people's expectations and how, how they're informed by that. Because, um, you know, if you have a, a Model 3 performance or a Model Y performance, for example, um, there, you know, Tesla's always been in in terms of manufacturing able to deliver produce and deliver the performance models a lot faster than the long range or the standard range models so you can't really you know if you have one of those you you can i can place an order today and get one in six weeks you can't really ask over msrp for that one of the things i know i'd like to understand is information about the volume of vehicles in the u.s that are coming out as electric now for example here in the uk every month we get the uh, figures from from the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders, which gives for each month and for year to date the breakdown of new vehicle registrations. And the ones for August just came out yesterday. And electric vehicles, full battery electric vehicles, now account for um, 14% of all vehicles sold in the UK. Do do you have any sort of similar information for the U.S. market? That's a that's a great question, actually, and it's it's not something that we follow super closely. Um, you know, general estimates are that it's kind of about um, you know twelve or so percent, twelve to thirteen percent of of new vehicle registrations. Um, there are a lot of statistics, you know, about Tesla's Model Three and and things that it's, you know, it it kind of varies from quarter to quarter, but it's among the top, you know, three, um, three to four, sometimes even top two uh, most popular selling new vehicles. But yeah, at, it, by and large, I think in the U.S. it's you know somewhere between twelve and fourteen percent on average, at least the most recent statistics. Let's get specific. Uh, if we if we take Tesla out of the picture for the answer to this question. What are the popular used electric vehicles in the United States? I mean, is is the Chevy Bolt something that's sort of still rounded about in terms of um, used electric vehicles? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So, um, yeah, the Bolt is moderately popular in the U.S. Um, not not nearly as popular as some others. Um, in terms of deliveries, just sheer deliveries. Oddly enough, the Mustang Mach E was the you know beyond Tesla was the most produced um, electric vehicle in the U.S., most delivered anyway, um, as of last quarter. So that's been pretty popular. And that's been around for a couple of years, which is so strange to me because I just don't see them as much, you know, as I see other things. Um, and, and we're in Minneapolis. We're in a fairly big metro area and just even, you know, other places in the country. We don't we don't see as many of them, but by the numbers, um, that's pretty popular. Um, Nissan Leaf, right? Like that's been around for... Um, you know, eight, nine, ten years, you know, in, in meaningful volume. And um, those, we don't see a ton of those, you know, come through our site. We don't see a ton of those, although the numbers are there. We, we don't see many of them. Um, Rivian has become, I, I would say personally that Rivian is probably, um, and this sort of circles back to, you know, one of your questions earlier, Rivian is probably the second most popular um in terms of numbers, social media exposure, um, just buzz in the EV community, EVs that we're seeing on our site um, after Tesla. And, and part of that's probably because it's the first EV truck and trucks are very popular here in the US. Um, and you know you can actually get one for not a ridiculous amount over MSRP right now. It was kind of ridiculous when it started, but it's, it's gotten a lot cheaper now. Um, so yeah, Rivian, Nissan Leaf, uh, Mustang Mach E, um, you know, Lucid is such a cool car, and they're just so luxurious and slick looking, and they have that f- over 500 mile range, but they're just so low volume. Um, we don't see the, we don't see many of those. 
Um, Elon sort of famously said that if they don't improve their numbers, they'll go bankrupt. Rivian will go bankrupt and whatnot. And, and so hopefully that's not the case because, you know, me and you and everyone in the EV community, we'd love to see, uh, you know, more EVs in the marketplace and kind of that push towards sustainable transport. But um, yeah, I think those are some of the most popular makes and models beyond uh, Tesla. The big sort of pushback I get when talking about electric vehicles over here is, well, they're so expensive. When am I going to be able to get one for, uh, you know, I mean, the, the popular car over here is is something like, uh, you know, a Ford Fiesta, which you could pick up for, uh, you know, equivalent of $1,500, uh, bucks, $2,000, uh, something like that. So are the oldest used electric vehicles in the US now reaching that point where, you know, the regular people can look at them and think, yeah, I'll get one of those rather than a, you know, a Toyota Camry. Or is that still quite a while away? That's a great question. That's a a really great question. Um, And it's something we think about, you know, a lot when we're looking at where's the market headed and what does that mean for Find My Electric and how can we serve customers in the EV industry as things change and adapt. And, you know, the, the best answer to that is I think that a lot of people are sort of turned off by the the idea of limited range in the older EVs, limited range and limited um, infrastructure, right? So like it, it, it's kind of counterintuitive, but it makes you think like, okay, so you look at a Nissan Leaf when you can get one, you know, for less than half the price of a Model 3, why aren't they more popular? Or there's actually a YouTube video about, I believe it was, um, wasn't the governor, but it was, um, I think a mayor, one of the cities in, um, California in Southern California, it might have been San Francisco, maybe the mayor of San Francisco or Los Angeles. I think it was one of those two who had a really old school um, Ford Focus EV, um, which Ford made super low production, you know, and, and I think it only gets like 60 miles of range. But he basically said, look, you know, it cost me, you know, like less than 10 grand. I picked it up on a deal. I can drive, you know, 10 miles to the government office or 12 miles one way, 12 miles back. And 80, 90% of the time, that's all that I drive. Um, So it works for me, but there just isn't like mass adoption of those. And I think, I don't know if it's people just really crave the ability to go further here in the U S or, you know, have like have a range that's more synonymous with a tank of gas, but um, they just haven't, those older EVs that are cheaper with the lower range, they really haven't caught on here in terms of, you know, being really popular in the secondhand market. The absolute most popular vehicle in the secondhand market is the Model 3. And I think it really hits a price point of there are enough people who can afford, you know, that sort of, you know, 40, maybe 50 grand, you know, mark for a used Model 3. And they still are getting, you know, 200 and you know, 40, 50 on the low range for standard range model three, or, you know, 300 plus miles of range for a long range model three. And it kind of strikes that balance for them. Um, So we're seeing, you know, a lot of demand for those in the used market, but in terms of being able to get one for, you know, I'd say like you mentioned a Ford Fiesta, like what's kind of synonymous here in the U S is a Toyota Camry or actually a Toyota Corolla or Honda Civic, right? Like these, you know, um, sort of uh, Japanese manufactured, you know, econo boxes, we call them here, they're bullet bulletproof, and they're cheap. And if you, you know, can only have one car, and you need something economical, like that's just what you get, it makes sense on a, tons of different levels. And yeah, it's not, it kind of kind of raises back sort of, um, you know, to the, the, thir- the fabled $35,000 Model 3, right? Like it was on the map for just a little bit, and then they pulled it and then it became 40 and then they said enough people didn't want it and they wanted the, you know, upgraded interior and things like that. So, um, that, that wasn't around too long, but I think we're, I think we're, you know, to, to kind of circle back and answer your question as, as pointedly as possible, I think it's a ways off. You know, I think that, I don't think you're ever going to see based just, just from a purely economic perspective, EVs that are that cheap. Because, you know, inflation is sort of raging in the U.S. and there are various efforts underway to sort of calm that down. But the 
prices that things are right now probably aren't going to decrease a ton, but as time goes on, prices will increase and, you know, some of those older prices will level out, incomes will rise. And so, you know, what is now, you know, a, a $15,000, $10,000, you know, or $8,000 Honda Civic might be in the future, uh, you know, equivalent, you know, say in 10 years and 15 years with a, you know, $30,000, $25,000 secondhand Model 3, something like that. I think over time, as EVs proliferate and as, you know, just incomes rise and, and economic factors sort of roll out, um, that'll sort of be the new, you know, eight ten thousand $10,000 Civic. But it's going to take some time. I don't see it happening anytime soon to answer your question. Now, one, you, you touched briefly then on the American um, desire to drive long distances. And of course, the, you know, everybody talks about Route 66 and traveling across the uh, the U.S. And, you know, there's, there's this big perception that, no, oh, we can't do this in electric vehicles. And yet it wasn't that long ago that the Porsche Taycan uh, did the cross-country uh, route. And I think it stopped for what was it? Something in the region of two and a half hours for charging across 2,800 miles. So I think a lot of the issues that people have, and it's the same in the UK, you know, oh, I want to be able to drive up to see my relatives in Scotland and it's, you know, 600 miles and my car will only do 200 miles. And, you know, my old diesel used to be able to do it without filling, et cetera. You know, I think there's a lot of uh, misinformation and, and, incorrect perception around that how do we bat that it's a good question um how do you combat that how do you bring evs mainstream you know how do you help people understand that you can uh you know get 80 percent charge in 15 minutes from the tesla supercharger and and that's generally enough and you can just stop for that you know it, it's tough because range anxiety is a real thing right like people you know worry about having to plan out a a trip around say tesla superchargers for instance when you know if you have a, a gas car you just kind of don't think about it you just go and you know there'll be a gas station somewhere so i think just time is just going to take time um for for everyone to catch up just any sort of new technology you know i mean i'm i'm in my 30s so i remember when i'm, I'm old enough to remember when social media wasn't a thing which I kind of like <laughs> that that's, that's the case, um, you know, that I'm, I'm old enough to remember. I'm young enough to be, you know, completely savvy with all of it, but I'm old enough to remember when it wasn't a thing. Um, and so I think it's just, it's just going to take time as with any, any new thing that's introduced, you know, it takes time for people to come around. It takes time for the technology to get better. I think in terms of your question about what we can do, um, is sort of, you know, EV evangelists and people in the EV community to help educate people. I think podcasts like this are a great thing because, you know, people listen to this and these have, uh, you know, pretty good reach. I think, you know, one thing that we try to do at, at Find My Electric is, um, you know, we have a pretty robust blog. So we write a lot of content about EVs and, you know, a lot of our content's geared toward the buyer and seller market because that's what our customers are the most interested in, but, you know, we also talk about, um, you know, EVs in general and, and, you know, um, electrification and things like that. So, you know, kind of just putting out content out there is helpful. I think, um, even something on a small level, talking to friends and family. And I know just people who I know friends and family, you know, who have questions about, um, you know, like one thing I, I was at a, a wedding, not so long ago and was talking to a, you know, friend's uncle. And he said to me, well, you know, like, what's the whole point of, of charging an electric car? You know, that, that electricity has to come from a, a coal power plant, you know, or uh, whatnot. And I said, well, yeah, but that power plant is an order of magnitude more efficient than your tailpipe, you know? So, um, you know, and that, that's a huge thing that people don't understand, you know, and, and, and just kind of chatting about it. I mean, uh, myself and co-founder of my business partner, Find My Electric, we've both been car guys our whole lives. So we love um, engaging, you know, with people just in the car community and EV community in general. So just chatting and, and you know, socializing and being able to educate people. And so I, I was able to talk to this guy um, who, who I was chatting with at this wedding. And, and he said, well, you know, I guess you're right. I didn't really think about it that way. You know, and then we sort of talked about 
just other things related to EV and infrastructure. And so just from that, you know, one conversation, you end up having someone who's got a bit, who's got a new perspective, you know, on it. So it's kind of a holistic thing. I think, I think every little bit helps and, and anything that you can do to, um, you know, educate people and, and chat about cars and EVs in general. And, and then just takes time, I think too. Uh, excellent points. Um, and thank you for the call out for the podcast. Appreciate that. Uh, just final question for me now. One of the big, not necessarily issues, but differences that, that in my perception between the way things are in the United States, the way things are in the United Kingdom, is we're a little bit more united in terms of we've got Wales, we've got um, England, we've got Scotland. And pretty much from an electric vehicle point of view, things are pretty much the same all around. Scotland has a couple of things that make it more advantageous for electric vehicles. Whereas in the States, every state seems to do things differently. And my perception is a state like California, for example, is much more pro-electric vehicles than somewhere like, oh, I don't know, West Virginia um, or you know Detroit, uh, Michigan, where, uh, where they make a lot of the, uh, the cars. What sort of yeah, is is that an accurate perception, and and how does that affect the kind of work that you do? That's a great question as well. Um, and yeah, I think that's generally an accurate perception. I think you're going to have you know different types, different demographics of people in different geographical areas. So California is kind of widely known as a very um, forward thinking, you know, progressive state. They're always trying to, you know, institute new rules and make changes, um, and you know, California, for instance, um, was, I believe, the first state in the U.S. to institute a ban against smoking cigarettes inside. And now, you know, decades later, everyone's caught up with that. You know, you can't sit in a, uh, you know, hospital and smoke cigarettes and you can't, you know, smoke cigarettes in a government office and a lot of other places. But at the time when California came out with that, it was kind of, uh, you know, it was shocking to a lot of people who were accustomed to, to doing that kind of stuff. And so, um, yeah, you're, you're right that, that things are different across states. And so, um, you know, so in, Min- in Minnesota here, which is kind of generally viewed as um, maybe not as forward thinking or progressive as California, but more so than a lot of other places in the U.S., um, it's kind of crazy how Minnesota lags behind in EV legislation. Um, so we really don't have any incentives here. Um, and you wouldn't think it, but some states in the south of the U.S., which maybe, you know, would fall under the umbrella of what you explained, not not as aggressive about, you know, adopting EVs, they have great incentives. Like if you buy an EV, you get, you know, a, a tax incentive or you don't pay sales tax on the EV. And we don't have anything like that here. Um, and, you know, so it's very variable among states. And sometimes it really runs, um, it, it's counterintuitive to what you would think you know, in terms of the demographic of the people there. So yes, you're correct. Um, a lot of states here, very different demographics, different ideas about things. And so in the U.S., you know, we obviously have the, the executive, the, you know, branch of the government and then the federal government, which makes laws for, you know, all the states that, you know, sort of everyone has to follow. And then states have some uh, purview to make their own rules. And so the federal government is really trying to, um, you know, push um, adoption of EVs and things like that. Um, there's a new tax credit system that's coming out at the, in the first of the year to allow tax credits for um, manufacturers that were previously not eligible like Tesla. And there's a lot of different, um, you know, caveats and, and rules and things like that related to it. But I think at the federal level, they really try to unite the states, and there's a, a general sense that they're pushing toward EVs. Obviously, that depends a little bit on the political climate um, in the two-party system here in the U.S. You know, there are um, some some people in certain parties who are who are pressing more for it, some who are not, some in in an opposite party who sort of run contrary to their party's opinion. So there's kind of an ebb and flow, you know, to that here in the U.S. But I think overall, there's federal initiatives that are continually rolling out, you know, for EVs at like various levels of aggression. And then, you know, the states are kind of doing their own thing. But I think there's just a general sense of rising tide. So the federal government helps with that. And then just even in the states where it's not, they aren't being adopted as well, they're still being, you know, just kind of pulled along by everyone else. And, and 
like I said, a rising tide scenario where 20 years ago, California was the only one to ban uh, smoking indoors, but now it's the same thing everywhere. Brian Elstat, thank you very much for your time. Much appreciated. If you're not wanting a used EV, then keep listening to the season because later on we will have an episode on how to get a new EV on your drive where we talk about leasing, buying, subscriptions, uh, and things like salary sacrifice. It's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. An electrolyzer that collects atmospheric water vapor, including from seemingly bone dry air, and converts it into hydrogen has been developed by Australian and international researchers. It's a thing called the Direct Air Electrolysis Module, and it works by using solar or wind power to take air with almost zero humidity, 4% at its lowest, and attract this to a harvesting module containing a hygroscopic material, i.e. one that attracts water. Electrodes on either side using solar or wind power the electrolysis itself, and the result is hydrogen and oxygen. In tests, they've run the machine for numerous days, extracting pure hydrogen from thin air. Given that estimates put the amount of humidity in the air at 12.9 trillion tonnes of water, it's a pretty interesting sounding process. Check out the link in the show notes for more information, including a rather official looking diagram and some calculations. The EV Musings podcast is sponsored by ZapMap. ZapMap is the go-to app for EV drivers in the UK. Use it to search for available chargers, plan electric journeys, pay for charging on participating networks, and share updates with other EV drivers. ZapMap is free to download and use, with subscription plans for enhanced features, such as using ZapMap in car, on CarPlay, or Android Auto. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at evmusings at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at MusingTV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Music's patron. The link is in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? Well, if you enjoyed this episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash EV Musings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash EV Musings. I have a couple of ebooks out there if you want something to read on your Kindle. So you've got it electric is available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent. And it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. So you've got renewable is also available on Amazon for 99p. And it covers installing solar panels, a storage battery and a heat pump. Why not check them both out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and you're still listening, thank you. Why not let me know you got to this point by tweeting me at Music TV with the words used, pre-loved or secondhand. Hashtag if you know you know. Nothing else. Thanks as always to my co-friend Simon. You know he's always wanted to enter Britain's Mastermind competition. I reckoned he'd do well on the general knowledge question, so I wondered what his specialist subject would be. He told me... That's a great question. That's a, a really great question. Thanks for listening. Bye.